Hi, welcome back to another episode of Tuba People TV, where we talk about Arnold Jacobs all of the time. Puddles and I are in Geneva, beautiful Geneva, Switzerland, with a solo trumpet since 1984 of the Swiss Romand Orchestra, Steve Jondeur. Perfect. Did I get that? Very good. Very good. I've been struggling. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Steve um, took the schooling at the Cleveland Institute mm -hmm. of Music, yeah. student of Bernie Edelstein, and uh, uh, you know, good journey there, lots of great studies, and uh, came here to Europe before 1984. Since 79. 79, started out in Kassel, the orchestra right. in Kassel, Germany. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, and then 84 came to this position. And along the way, you, you had some studies with uh, Arnold Jacobs. So I'm just wondering, uh, I did. Well, how'd that start? <laughs> <laughs> well, when I was studying with Bernie, uh, it would have been probably by freshman or sophomore year at the institute, I was studying already with him in high school. Uh, and I, I kind of, well, I, going back farther, I started, my very first teachers were great. In fact, my very first teacher was somebody who's also done Tuba People TV, is Ross Beecraft. No kidding. Yeah, Ross Beecraft. Hey, Ross. Good job. Yeah. When he was an undergrad at Eastman, and my parents were in Rochester, and he was uh, he was great. I think I paid seventy five cents for a <laughs> half hour lesson. Those those guys at these those students at Eastman were getting taken. Wow. Well. I think it was a buck twenty five for an hour, but he was great because he taught just it was basically imitation, which I think is still in many ways the best way to teach imitate. Mm -hmm. Just imitate it. And uh, then I went on to Cleveland. I studied with Tom Walder, also a teacher taught by imitation. And it was all happening very kind of fun and naturally for me. But then you kind of get to that age where you start to notice yourself. Uh, you start to notice girls. <laughs> you start to notice your chops. <laughs> right. And uh, I started trying to play correctly instead of sound good a little mm -hmm. bit and went through that kind of a thing. So I was dealing with some, you know, production problems. And uh, Bernie Einstein was a fabulous musician, fabulous coach, uh, but admitted that he had no idea as far as you know, solving playing problems go. And so he said, I can't help you, but I, I know something you can. Hmm. And he picked up the phone and he called Arnold Jacobs right there. No then, kidding. Yeah. Which was, I think, and this is 1976, it was, it was hard for an undergrad student to get a lesson with Jacobs at that time. There were a lot of professionals who were going to see him. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that I would have been able to had I just tried to do it myself, but he picked up the phone and he, he basically set it all up. From right the there. So you got yep. the lesson on the first try. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I got it on the first shot. Congratulations. And uh, I basically went to Chicago for six weeks that summer. And... I remember thinking, okay, I'll, I'll have a, a lesson every week. And that's my first lesson. He said, okay, come back in two weeks. So I think I had three lessons over a six-week period of time. In the meantime, what was I going to do in Chicago <laughs> as a 20-year-old you know, right. kid? Uh, but, um, I mean, I found things to do. There was Rush Street. There was fabulous stuff to mm -hmm. do. But I was, um, my parents had a friend who was house-sitting uh, a home on McCormick Ave. Uh, the big one from the McCormick's, mm -hmm. big big name, mm -hmm. up on in Astor Street in the kind of the gold, the coast area. Yeah. They call it. So I had this big kind of mansion to myself all day, and um, I remember, uh, you know, Marl Jacobs wanted me to get away from exercise and he wanted me to practice melodies, just singing melodies. And I remember uh, finding old books uh, at the house of old, you know, Cole Porter tunes. And Gershwin melodies because there was a piano there. Was that the McCormick house? Happened at this yeah. McCormick house, okay. at this private house. And I remember it, I pulled out a hymnal. I think I, I played through the entire hymnal. Mm -hmm. I figured my soul had better be saved by the end of that summer. I'm not sure that's the case, but it did save my playing. But um, it's a start. <laughs> yeah, so he had me basically get away from all of that and just doing like, back to the imitation in a way that I was I started to. But um, uh, there were some, you know, technical things that uh, we worked on. In particular, uh, I have a rather crowded mouth okay. and a large tongue. Uh, I you probably stuck the oh yeah 
Yeah. Put, put his flashlight into your. Who took, took a look? Didn't have tonsils. He was relieved to know they'd taken my tonsils out. But there was there was a, not a lot of room in there. Okay. So we did a lot of work on bowel sounds mm -hmm. and being aware of the tongue positions and the study of the bowels. And of course, there was a lot of the breathing uh, that we did. Uh, one of the things he he uh, emphasized with me, and maybe more than other uh, former. Jacob students that I've talked to that they, they acknowledge it, but with me he worked quite a bit on it. It was it was this ability to get what he called the zero factor, the ability to inhale and to be able to hold it without pressurization. Mm -hmm. uh, so in other words, the inspiratory muscles are still active. You're not totally relaxed, right? But you're not you're not you're not there's no expiratory muscles being activated yet, right? And so that was something we worked on a lot. So I could get to that. You can say be like a state of surprise. You. Yeah, and he would hold it. And I have to say, that was a huge, huge turning point for me. I'd gotten into kind of a hesitation before first attacks and building up too much pressure. And of course, it was mostly psychological. It, right. was, it was thinking too much about the applied technique and not enough about um, the song and not right. enough about the song. But um, that was a thing that really propelled me forward. And it's interesting because. I use it so much in the orchestra now. Uh, you really, I, I, every student I have, I say, you've got to learn how to do this because, you know, you get to the end of a soft chord in the Brahms symphony, let's say something like the, the chords of the second movement of the first symphony, and the conductor goes, and you don't know where you're going to put it, you know. So right. you, you can't breathe in rhythm. You've got to have that ability to hold it. Right. And uh, I remember. Uh, during a, um, on tour with uh, Dutois, with Charles Dutois, we did a tour with pictures and an exhibition. And he's a one, wonderful conductor, but he has kind of a, a he kind of conducts from the, kind of swagger when he conducts, and he gives upbeats much faster than the tempo. And on top of that, he would jump on the podium, turn around, give me this oh thing, and, you know. So I, when I saw him on, step on his toe, I was already taking my breath. You know, and I just held it right. in the zero factor until I saw that gesture, and then I would start. You know, I've kind of got my tempo going, bob, 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 my head. But without that ability, I would have found it extremely difficult to do that. Yeah. And so it's something that I use, but it also is something that probably was one of the biggest initial things he did to really help me with my tone production. So with the the zero point um, study or uh, application that he did. Zero factor. Yeah. Zero factor. Yeah. Um, seems like you mentioned hesitation. Yeah, I remember him. That was a. Uh, in many cases, he would use use that as a. A remedy. Yep. To help yep. that. And, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, anything else comes to mind? I, I think it was also that uh, I mean he always had to do the breathing exercises away from the instrument. Mm. And I think uh, as much as one would try to do that, there would, sometimes when I take a breath, I was thinking about that, not. The pitch. So he actually separated the two. Yeah. So that I would took, take the breath in a very relaxed state, hold the breath without pressurization, then sing the note in my head, and, and then that way I kind of eventually was able to meld the two together. But I think that was one of the ways in which he went about it. The the incredible thing is that, and I think just about everybody who studied with him had this experience, is that in about five minutes. He had you getting a more resonant, more beautiful sound with greater ease, and it was almost a little scary because you'd say, "How did I do that? That was me, and it felt like nothing." You know. Yeah. And uh, sometimes I think when you hear uh, you know people who didn't have the experience of studying with them, and they hear "Song and Wind" and Kunt's concept is very strong, they they kind of don't they didn't have the experience, and that's and it's true. I mean, uh, it was kind of like. Uh, well, you know, you're so used to um, manipulating things and having a certain comfort, a feeling of control, mm -hmm. which was setting something or um, mm -hmm. which was unnecessary and actually detrimental tension in your, either in your playing or tongue position or your abdomen. That when it was so easy, it would it kind of would, would take you back. But it was almost like saying, "I'm going to jump in a pool and not sure if there's water in it." <laughs> you know. <laughs> You had to learn to trust that he was right, and of course, it, 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 it felt so easy that it was kind of amazing. But he also kind of built trust, because 
uh, just his kindness, just his uh, ability to connect with you, and then of course you also just had his own playing, and then the whole, you know, Chicago Symphony and Hearst, that's everybody approaching the instrument this way. He had this credibility, yeah. but it was also something that he had that, that that voice was very reassuring, and you kind of. I used to want to go to my lessons and hope that all my problems were evident, because I, I, you know, some days it, it, it would work, and I didn't want it to because I, I wanted his help, I wanted him to understand, but that was really never an issue because I think in, a, in about five or six notes he, had, he knew exactly what was going on, yeah. physiologically. Yeah, exactly. he, he really had a great... Uh, knack for diagnosing Incredible. very quickly. He could hear sound. And I think he taught me to hear sound. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I had a general idea of a pleasant sound. I, I'd been exposed to good sounds in, in Cleveland. Uh, but I, after a while I started to hear a sound that was healthier. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, the sound could still be very nice to listen to, but, you know, it might be just a little bit uh, forced. Right. And you would hear the efficiency then, and the kind of a flawless tone production, an easy tone production. So I, eventually I learned to hear that as well. But I, I do think uh, the other thing that was remarkable about him was his ability to size, not only figure out what the problems were, what the blockages were, or whatever that was holding you back, but uh, he kind of could figure out the person very quickly. So he knew if you were somebody that needed more explanation, you were maybe more Cartesian and wanted assurances by knowing how things worked, or he would figure there was somebody who worked better with images, mm -hmm. and he would find these keys to kind of unlock those things. But I don't think it was the same for everybody, because when you talk, they all had somewhat different experiences. Mm -hmm. So this is what I think, in many ways, uh, his most extraordinary gifts were as a teacher. Yeah, that with, with talking to somebody for five minutes, he kind of could figure out where they were coming from. Yeah, now he would sometimes say that the first lesson was... For him. For him, actually, yeah. so he could yeah. just learn more about you. Yeah. He still charged you, but <laughs> but it really was. It was it was a time for him to get to know you and figure out your learning styles and your communication styles, yeah. what you what turned you on, you know, what, what motivated you in a positive way, what motivated you in a negative way. Yeah. and Very quickly, though. Very quickly. Very quickly, yeah, for sure. Um, wow, that's terrific. Yeah. For, for me, the, the interesting thing was that I had the, the luxury, I would say it's kind of a luxury, but an incredible chance to uh, study with him over a 20-year period. My first lesson was when I was 20, my last one was when I was 40. Mm. Uh, so I came to him in various different stages of playing. Right. I'm not sure how much his teaching changed at that time. I think his teaching changed more from like the 50s to the 70s. He refined his ideas more from what I understand. Mm -hmm. But he was certainly dealing with a different player and a different person because there would be gaps. Right. I think the longest gap maybe was five years or so when I didn't came. So when I came, I, I came to him as a 20 year old student and then a couple more times as a student and then as a professional mm -hmm. and then as, you know, somebody actually entering into their into their mid-years and preparing me for the future, which mm -hmm. was another thing that he could do. But there was, uh, there was no ceiling to what you could learn from him. Yeah. Why'd you come back? Well, I, you know, I, I, I came back simply because the, the lessons were always incredibly inspiring. And uh, I, I remember at the period kind of thinking, okay, you know, I, I, I've got it. I got the whole thing. I, my breathing is pretty good. I got, but then, then I started to realize as my playing career that there were many more facets that I could get easier and make easier, mostly mental, mostly letting go psychologically, not uh, over controlling, also just dealing with uh, stress and, and performance nerves. Mm -hmm. I realized that he was had a key to all of that. And uh, so I went back. And uh, I remember I went back from a, a lesson, well, about, there was about a gap about five or six years, and it, it just blew me away. And uh, again, he had me playing with just a much better sound. And Do you remember what he did? Uh, what was going on in that? Uh... 
It was actually kind of a continuation of some of the earlier things, mm -hmm. but uh, getting it more refined, getting the tongue even lower. Uh, he, 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 he noticed that there, there was some hardness in my attacks from orchestral playing. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, uh, and also, because on first trumpet, he spent a lot of time in the high register. Yeah. He, he, he picked up the fact that I could get I could have greater ease up there, and um, so it was kind of working the same way or the same concept, but he worked with me differently. Mm -hmm. He worked, uh, uh, he actually then probably gave me more technical information than when I was younger. Huh. Interestingly enough, uh, I mean he told me why this, right. this happened. When I was younger, it was just kind of do this and forget about all this stuff. Yeah, well, you know we want to get all this. Uh, self-analysis out yeah by the time he worked with me when I was in my 30s he realized that a little bit of self-analysis was something I could deal with and it wasn't going to disrupt my playing mm -hmm. but it would maybe help me to move quicker into uh, uh, another stage of playing mm -hmm. but it wasn't it wasn't it was really kind of letting me ignore more for my own teaching too to let me know what what actually the physiological processes are mm -hmm. and um, it was so good that um, I came back a few other times. One time when the orchestra was on tour in Chicago. And then when I was about 40, I could feel that, you know, things were changing a bit. And I said, I'm going to go back. And my wife said, look, you've always talked about Arnold Jacobs. I'm giving you this as a present. You go. And uh, she paid my way to Chicago. And uh, I had two two-hour lessons in, in one week. And... Um, I, it, it opened up a whole other side of him I didn't know because then he was really teaching music, phrasing, the idea of building phrases. Mm -hmm. You know, he was, he was kind of, um, uh, had brought up in that tabito tradition where you really give the note its, its, its structure within the phrase rather right. than just thinking of the whole phrase. Yeah. And that changed an enormous amount for me as well. Yeah. All of a sudden I had a whole other um, grasp of things that I, I just thought of as kind of a wave. All of a sudden, I realized you, there, there's stages to that wave, and you build your phrases. Right. And I had much more control over the instrument, much more control musically of what, what I wanted. Yeah. yeah. So he talked a lot about the the the, the, the building phrases with the tabito. He didn't even go. I mean, he did talk about the tabito. Actually, would assign like numbers, numbers. and grouping, and yeah, right. the, uh, crescendos, and decrescendos, right. one through five, right. five right. or three, right. one or something. Yeah. But he would do those exercises from the potag, you know, da 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 and really do all that phrasing. And I remember him saying, he said, this is, this is, you'll, you'll use a lot of this in Mahler. And I said, boy, the next time I went and played Mahler, I totally approached it differently. And it's true. All of a sudden, you felt like you had much more control over your expression. Yeah, I mean, didn't, and the, the, the really cool thing about it is that, is it put your mind in the right place? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Instead of self-analysis or being worried, your brain is filled with information about communicating to the audience rather than being That's afraid. It, it, it was. It, he always talked from the very beginning, my very first lesson of the twenty, about telling us, telling a story. Right. But there, he was really giving me the technique to tell the story in many ways. Uh, he, you know, he explained how uh, and in length of note, style. Uh, I realized that there was no ceiling musically. Uh, you know, I think a lot of, of uh, the emphasis in his reputation was as a problem solver mm -hmm. of uh, sound production or, or the psychology of playing. But in fact, there was a whole other. I, and I would have continued to go back had he had he lived longer. I would, I'd still be going back. Right. <laughs> I'd still be going back because I realized there was just no ceiling to what I could learn. The musician was so extraordinarily as advanced and as ahead of his time in a lot of ways that he was with the psychological and, and, and technical information. What do you recall, um, you know, when he revealed to you this note grouping or microphrasing, you know, he would say, um, audiences hear phrases, musicians build phrases. Build phrases. Yeah. Right. yeah. What do you recall from after you applied that, or maybe it was in the lesson you applied that, what was your memory of that or when you took it back to work? I, I remember having no one ever telling me that before. Yeah. And I studied with some very good musicians. Yeah. But we, we often talked about, and I learned a lot about style by imitation. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I, I think primarily uh, what I felt was uh, much more control 
not only of the instrument, but it also made me think about what I really wanted to say when I would look at a phrase. I would, I would uh, musically it changed the way I would approach something. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, it made more sense to me, maybe what the composer had written to give more structure. And, and uh, it enabled a, a wider range of expression because I felt like I had such control over maybe just eight notes, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. But I knew exactly where I wanted to go and exactly how to put it. And as you say, it keeps you completely in the present time. Right. It's very similar. He would describe it to me, as I recall. Um, uh, you know, I'm I'm telling you s uh, s uh, information, and you are receiving the information, and you're evaluating the information really on a sentence-wide basis. Whereas I'm only th I'm only thinking of a few words, a word or two or three putting them together, right. at a time I'm constructing sentences and yeah. paragraphs, yeah. you're hearing sentences and paragraphs, but I'm constructing them only a word or two or three at a time. Yeah, exactly. And uh, uh, so, yeah, it just puts your, it puts your mind on, on the message. It puts your mind on the message. And I think it also helps you to make, in a way, uh, even though the phrase is written by the composer, and, and, and in many cases something like Mahler, it's very specific what he wants you to do, but it also... Um, uh, it it kind of helped. It helped to make it your own, mm -hmm. uh, because exactly like that. When you're, when, when I'm saying, speaking to you, and you're receiving the information, I'm putting together my thoughts word by word, and so it gives a tremendous spontaneity, even though it's actually a very uh, planned out thing. It makes the music making very spontaneous. It really does. Yeah, it really does. And I've noticed. You know, it just as I've, um, I've gotten older, um, I become less patient mm -hmm. when I hear people who are gloss over something. Yeah, they're just they they might as well just be. They're, it's like they're speaking in monotone. Yeah. yeah. When they're when they're playing. Yeah. Music where the yeah. where the notes don't really yeah. have any yeah. meaning. There's yeah. no structure there. Yeah. It's just notes. Exactly. There's no communication. Exactly. And the irony of it is that it sounds spontaneous and it sounds exciting. Much more exciting, right? And uh, certainly there is kind of a you know a, a moment in the performance where the adrenaline does push it, but it's uh, the excitement is is in the way it is the music has been thought out and the way it's being delivered. That's why in rehearsal it can sound almost as exciting. It shouldn't the audience sounds a little bit, right? But but um, it, it it I think as I I'm nearing the end of my playing career now, but the lessons I hear in the back of my head every day from him because. I often am recalling things. Uh, it was all kind of about y you let go. Uh, it's all about letting go, but it's it, that's that has a very uh, firm structure underneath it. Mm -hmm. Once you have that, you you don't need to control all the little um, details. Yeah, because your brain works on percentages, and so if you're trying to really, mm, you're so tight about it, then yeah. you don't have the op you don't create this opportunity for your, for really just the, the normalcy of your skill set yeah your artistry to exactly come out. exactly you're not you're, you're not if you get out of the way get out of the way get out of the way just trust that that if it goes well in rehearsal it's gonna go well yeah, yeah. And, and because you plan the music out it, it will go well because you you're not it, it sounds spontaneous but actually it's just something that you you are very secure about right and you know, you when you become more adept at this this kind of way, this note grouping, microphrasing way of thinking mm -hmm. about music, you can, I mean, you can really have fun with it. Yeah, and exactly. change it up. Yeah, exactly. and I don't know, you. I mean, uh, what was it uh, at dinner? What was the piece that uh, La Mer? You've done <laughs> yeah. most on tour, right? La Mer yeah. with yeah. the Swiss Roman Orchestra and this. Yeah, so I mean, after. 40 or 50 times of Lemaire is, you know, what's you got to try to find something new, <laughs> even more interesting. So it's a natural way and a very musical approach to stay engaged and involved yeah. as an artist. Yeah, absolutely. For the viewers, um, there's more about this microphrasing, note grouping on the Dave Federley interview. He, okay. he goes into it um, a bit, and we get out a little piece of music, and he demonstrates that. I showed that, yeah. yeah. There's also a very good book that was written by uh, Dave McGill called right. Sound and Motion, which Sound is about, motion. about the kind of topical approach to this building and structure. Yes, and one before that is uh, called Note Grouping. It's by an author named Thurmond, I believe. Okay. And I'll try and remember to put a photo of that on yeah. the uh, end of this video. Yeah. So, so um, Steve, you had the, this period, 20-year period, 
started out somewhat, I don't know, um, simple, direct, you know, suggestions from Jacobs. Then you move to the end of your last period of study where it's much more about art. Yeah. And uh, it, was there anything in the in the in that middle that middle period that uh, you call that way? There were there were a few things that I discovered on the way, maybe influenced by somebody else's. And then I I kind of say, oh, that's what he meant. I, you know, it was funny about conditioning on a brass instrument. He downplayed that quite a bit. He just said, you want to develop your high register, play an high register. You know, mm -hmm. play melodies. Play, you know, that's how it gets better. But he wouldn't. Uh, he would often drop little things, without a lot of explanation. That later I'd understand. I remember he told me once that. Uh, uh, he said you know, for refining the small muscles, muscles speed was something that refined refined the small, mm -hmm. the small muscles. And I, I remember taking a lesson with Philip Smith when I was young and professional. And it, I asked him if we'd done anything to develop his high register, which was extremely good, extremely solid. And he he did very fast kind of lip slurs up there. And um, I discovered that I started to do some of that. And when I my speed developed, I also had more control and more strength. And I thought, okay, well, Arnold Jacobs did tell me that, hmm. but he just kind of dropped it. He didn't want to go into that lot of that things about conditioning. He I think he thought by trial and error you'd you'd find your way. Mm -hmm. Another thing he told me once, I remember uh, about, you know, if you're, I asked him about when you felt stiff or swollen from a heavy concert, and he said, uh, apply cold afterwards, apply warmth before, but it was nothing more than that. And then my wife is a dancer, she said, oh, well, we should ice, do you ever ice? You know, you know nobody ever told me to ice, but that's applying cold right. afterwards, and of course in the shower you put it on, and often that does get the blood circulating, mm -hmm. it's all about circulation of the blood and getting the lactic acid down. But he, he obviously had that information, but he dosed it out kind of, I don't, I don't think he wanted to dwell on any kind of uh, too much awareness about what things felt like. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I do think that uh, uh, this, you know, it's, it's not, it's hard to do. We all are aware when your when you lip feels bad, but of course he always said just get more musical when it feels bad and if the concepts are strong, and it's true, if, you can pick it up and think, oh, this is going to be a rough day in about five minutes if you're, if you're just concentrating on sound. All of a sudden it feels fine. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, but I think, uh, again, that's a little like kind of jumping in the pool. You know, somebody thinks, oh, i got to do something about this. My, my lip is shot or, you know, right. uh, I'm really swollen today or something. And he, he, he always said when that's the case, he said it's the embouchure is a variable. Uh, you stabilize the sound, and and sure enough, he's so right. He's so right. Uh, I don't doubt it now. But there was a time where it was hard to think. Gee, you know, I feel like how am I going to do do this? Was it was it, uh, in John Bowen's uh, interview? Uh, John Bowen, lyric uh, opera principal horn, Grand uh -huh. Park principal horn, and uh, one day he couldn't play, and uh, so he went in to see Jacobs and had one lesson with Jacobs and totally saved his career. <laughs> And at some point in the uh, in the uh, the lesson, John said uh, recounts that Jacobs yelled out, "I'm sure they're tough. Lips are tough. You know, <laughs> don't baby them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry about it. Yeah, don't worry about it. Yeah. And uh, um, in a recent interview, um, uh, Bob Dore up in Minneapolis, second trumpet, and one lesson he had, um, he had just had a three-hour brass quintet rehearsal. Got a call from Jake, said, who was on a uh, vacation in Florida. Would, to visit his son, and that's where Bob was at the time. And said, and Bob had been saying, you know, if you have time, let me know, and I'd love to have a lesson. So no. Jake says, I have time now, and it just ha was at the end of this three-hour brass quintet rehearsal, <laughs> and so he's kind of chopped, mm -hmm. and he goes and to this lesson, and and uh, you know, Jake has him playing pictures at an exhibition, best that he's ever played. Yeah, 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 you know, yeah. Just, yeah, just amazing. Did he ever talk about this? Um, um, you know, with the, the high register, this ex maybe uh, somehow lowering the pressure. Uh, something that's not only Bob Dor talked about, which mm -hmm. is this this um, establishing your the, the uh, more airflow in the lower register, so right. as you ascend, you you have a little bit. You're carrying more airflow. Absolutely. In those middle years, when I I've been playing professionally for a number of years, and I went back, we talked about that period. Mm -hmm. uh, that was one of the things that he noticed. He said, you know, he said you're working too hard, 
already at the top of the staff. Mm -hmm. He said, you need to save that work for the Extreme Line Register. And one of the things he did was uh, get me to, sound-wise, totally with sound concept and without any discussion of embouchure, uh, he maybe got on me to keep about keeping that tongue down a little bit, but uh, he basically had me match my sound uh, in the lower and mid-register to the top of the staff. Imitate, you want me to imitate my sound. You want me to practice a lot of octaves, like play, you know, a G, three note G, and then up the octave and just match the sound. So lower notes teach the upper notes. Uh, lower notes teach the upper notes, exactly. And, and he wasn't, it wasn't like this, uh, the two octave, in my, in my own recollection with him was you had this octave relationship. Yeah. So it wasn't necessarily this bottom octave teaching the... Uh, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was it was octave by octave. Octave, pretty much octave by octave. I mean, you know, a classical trumpet player doesn't have maybe more than two and a half octaves. Right. Okay. Anyway, right. right. I mean, Doc Severinsen is another story. Sure. But <laughs> but uh, he, yeah. I mean, uh, he worked a lot on uh, actually this kind of. Um, uh, I think where he felt I needed the most refinement is that by playing with the heavy schedule, I've gotten a little bit forced mm -hmm. at the top of the staff. And I still had the high notes, but I was working too hard for him. And, and the sound was getting a little brittle. And um, as soon as he had me basically just the concept to get a rounder vowel and imagine a, 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 a more open, rounder sound around the top of the staff, then all of a sudden the true the top was really easy. I remember working on one of those uh, Walter Smith top tones, uh, two mm -hmm. that are hard. And there was a thing at halfway through the second page that went up to. Uh, I was playing a C trumpet, and I was playing it all on C, and it went up to uh, you know high Ds on the C trumpet, or it was a D with a B flat. But I was playing a C, and I thought, oh man, I'm never going to be able to get this out. And he had me these that you know the thick air blowing the thick this concept of thick air, but it was mostly sound concept. Yeah. And thinking of the t the tone is a lot rounder and a lot less penetrating. Yeah. Uh, and I just remember floating this stuff out and kind of going, whoa, how did I do that? You know? So your perception was that you were working less and sounding better? I'm working much less. Yeah. And a, a larger, resonant, much warmer sound. And he always, he was always saying, don't, don't, this is good for certain music. I'm not asking you to change anything. I'm asking you to introduce something new into your playing. Introduce more of a love song into your playing. Right. And he said, uh, you, you're, you're going to need that sometimes. Certain music, you want to you want to sound that's more uh, penetrating. You know, so he was he wasn't forgetting changing it. He just wanted it to be equalized, where it was the most efficient production and the most beautiful sound. So after uh, after these lessons, you know, um, you would write things down, and yes. uh, so um, I, I remember. Uh, Doing the same thing, and then, but on, and occasionally he would, uh, you know, I would record a lesson, and, right, and would be able to, to to remember these things. But uh, what do you remember from 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 that sort of thing? Just just writing furiously, furiously, trying to remember everything. Because yeah, at that when I first went, we didn't have, uh, you know, cassette recorders or, or any of that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, I just remember trying to remember everything and scribbling down. You can see my handwriting is almost furious fast. To get everything down, that I it was just so much information, don't new want to, information. Don't want to forget it. You don't want to forget it. Yeah. And um, much if I look at those notes now, of course, that's much of that the theme that was re repeated through my lessons with him. But yeah. Uh, later uh, in taping, when I started taping lessons, that was great because you would listen to them, and I'll still listen to them now, and I'll hear something new. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, you started in uh, the orchestra in Kassel, yes. Germany, right. and um, I'm wondering if you have any uh, particular vantage uh, or observations about Jacob's pedagogy coming to Europe and, and, and how, what was the path what, from your observations? From, yeah, from what, I mean, when I, I came over in the late 70s, at that time I would say probably the place where um, that was most aware of Arnold Jacobs teaching was Scandinavia. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was Michael Lind, Michael I don't know, I, 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 but I think, yeah, the Chicago Symphony, I don't think they did a lot of touring in Europe before Schulte, but around, around 70, they, they were going everywhere. Mm -hmm. And probably knowing, uh, I have many Scandinavian friends, and, 
That's the best education in the world. People are curious. If a bunch of brass players went and heard the Chicago Symphony, they probably said, I want to know how they play like that, and they wouldn't hesitate to mm -hmm. investigate because it's just curiosity. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's the way they are. And uh, so it was really already very strong up there. Uh, I remember I, I played quite a bit in Oslo a few years ago, and there was a man who uh, worked in the administration who had been the bass drum bone player. And he said, oh, I used to, I went and studied with Klein Hammer and Jake was back in like 1968 or something. Wow. You know, so this was already uh, there. Then, um, uh, pretty much, the, you know, it was very old school in the rest of Europe. Felt tight gut, mm -hmm. and, you know, kind of uh, uh, had to, you had to be a young, strong buck to play a, mm -hmm. a brass instrument. Uh, and when I came over, the level of brass playing in Germany was not very high. Mm -hmm. But that changed very quickly, and uh, of course now it's it's very high. It's yeah. very high. Yeah, all over the place. And, and I think that is a really a direct influence of Arnold Jacobs. I I came through this portal. Castle was kind of this portal, and I think the first person was was Bob Tucci, mm -hmm. who came, of course, a wonderful tuba player and right. student of Arnold Jacobs. But there was a Scottish conductor of the Castle Stadt Theatre Orchestra at the time whose name was James Lockhart. And he loved American brass playing ever since he, I guess he hired Bob Tucci, maybe Tucci was there when he came, but uh, that, that's kind of when the whole thing started. And by the time I'd come through, uh, the orchestra in Castle had, was, had gotten very comfortable with engaging American brass players. Huh. And uh, so, for instance, the, I think the first American trumpet player was a, a wonderful player, a friend of mine named David Taza. David was a uh, Hurset student and studied with, with Jacobs, and uh, he was the first trumpet in Castle who came over. Then there was uh, um, uh, Alan Kirkendall was another one, also a Chickowitz student. Uh, there was Rod Miller, also a Chickowitz Jacobs student, who came through. Dan Pickerill, all these guys from Chicago. Hmm. I was a kind of non-Chicago one, but I'd studied there. Right? Yeah, and I was still Midway. So right. there. And um, Gosh, there were, uh, and, and, and French horns, Eric Till Williger started there, who was, became principal horn of the Palace uh, Chavon Funk afterwards, and the Munich Philharmonic, one of the wonderful players in heard. And uh, Stefan Jazerski is a friend of mine who's now in the Berlin Philharmonic. He was from Cleveland. He was the one originally told me to come over. Hmm. Uh, a wonderful trombone player named Bill McElhaney went on to be in the Vienna Philharmonic. So in, in this time, in the mid to late 70s, uh, Castle was this portal of, of American brass players. Hmm. Most of us who had either studied with Arnold Jacobs or were influenced, certainly, by him. And uh, uh, I think that, and then there were other, there were other players in Hamburg and, and, and Munich as well, but there were quite a few American brass players in Germany at the time. And of course they taught. Uh, you know, the schools, were, the conservatories were smart. They engaged these guys to teach, and the next generation of German players were absolutely fabulous. Uh, great for brass playing, maybe not so great for American brass players, because right. there's not so many opportunities yeah. as there were at the time. Uh, it's kind of starting to tilt the other direction now. Yeah. I mean, you know, look at uh, Chicago. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. It, it's, yeah. yeah. And then, of course, uh, then there was big influence in Italy, in Spain as well. Uh, that that's been very strong in, in uh, that school, and, and a lot of uh, Roger Bobo was teaching in mm -hmm. I Italy, and um, uh, many a lot of Chicklet students, a lot of uh, uh, Jacob students. So uh, this whole schooling kind of that is founded on on Arnold Jacob's principles becomes very strong. The only place in Europe where it's still a little bit new is uh, the Francophone world. It's French speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, that's still that's still kind of old school, but that's changing a little bit. What's the what's the path into France in terms of Jacob's pedagogy? I don't know. I mean, a f friend of ours, Christian Steenstrup, yeah. you know, Christian. Sure. He's he's now done a master class in, in, uh, at the Conservatoire de Paris. Mm -hmm. There's, a, there's a, a new teacher there, Marc Goujon, I think is his name. He said he's really open and okay. very interested in other concepts. But uh, it's been kind of a closed, uh, closed thing in France for a long time, uh, and but I think that's about to change. Mm -hmm. But they they're proud of their own traditions and schools, and, and I understand sure. in some ways 
uh, you know, we we don't want orchestral sound to get so generic that it, it all sounds the same. And right. it's true that you know, 40 years ago, if you're the Orchestra de Paris and the Berlin Philharmonic and the London Symphony Orchestra and the Chicago Symphony were very, very, very different. different. It's less so, now. and yeah. it's less so. But uh, the one thing about uh, Jacob's teaching, which I think was not at first and maybe starting to be understood in France, is that it does not affect your 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 concept. It's efficiency, mm -hmm. and and if you it, it it may be it's true that if you're playing with a thicker air and and a larger oral cavity and more uh, resonance in your sound, that it's going to be a little darker as well, but you can very easily change that with equipment. You just use a, a mouthpiece that gives you more highs and less fundamental, right? If that's what you want, and uh, uh, but you're still playing efficiently and not working so hard, right? And uh, that gives you a greater range of expression. So you don't have to fit in. There's no. You don't have to sound like you're from Chicago if you play with this 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 uh, efficiency in your playing. You right. can still sound very French or very. German or you know yeah. you don't have to lose it completely. No, it's old it's schools. Efficient color. <laughs> That's right. It's just colors. It's just colors. with efficiency. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. In fact, you have you have a much wider range of color when you're that. You efficient. really do. Yeah. Yeah. You're not locked in. Much much bigger palette to yeah. work with. Yeah. So you may have noticed that uh, we have a couple of trumpets here, and um, we were talking before the interview started, and. Uh, it was he was telling me about these trumpets. I say, man, you gotta bring these, gotta bring these out. What can you tell me about these uh, these trumpets? Well, these are two these are two trumpets that my teacher Bernie Edelstein played most of his career on. Uh, this one is his old Mount Vernon C trumpet, which I play now. It's my main instrument, and that can be heard on all the Zell recordings. That's that's the instrument he's playing. Uh, later in the 70s, he, he had another one, and he'd alternate and go back and forth. But that's that's basically the trumpet he played from about 1960 to 1970 on consistently. Hmm. And it's a terrific instrument. Um, it's I had to have a new lead pipe and, and a wonderful uh, repairman in Chicago named Steve Winans. It's kind of fixed it up for me, but uh, uh, it's really nice to play. I mean, it makes me think of him. <laughs> and it's a great instrument. This was also his. This is a Benj D trumpet, and I think it's made in the 40s. So maybe in Chicago. Oh yeah, made in Chicago, yeah. absolutely, yeah. It's from the 40s, and uh, I believe, in fact I know, it was Lewis Davidson, who was Bernie's teacher, and also his predecessor in the Cleveland Orchestra, was his, and then he bequeathed it to, to Bernie, and Bernie bequeathed it to me. Wow. And that's that's the, uh, the kind of infamous Rite of Spring recording with Boulez, and the Cleveland Orchestra, that's what he's playing, that the, the, D, the famous D trumpet part. Of. So you use this uh, in the orchestra, both of these, you use this oh, in yeah, the Swiss yeah. Ramon? Yeah, I certainly do. I mean, use them uh, all the time. And I also have a piccolo trumpet. It's a Schilke, which is very early, Sarah. Oh. But uh, I have to basically three horns of his, and they're, the, they were better than what I had before. I, I don't just play them because they were his. I play them because they're really fantastic. They're great. Really good instruments, yeah. Wow, yeah, that's that's terrific. Yeah, and then you have this picture. What uh, what year would you say this picture was was taken? I would say that's probably somewhere around 97, 96. Okay, yeah, yeah. My last lessons with with Arnold Jacobs were a couple months before he passed, but this was not in my very last lessons. This was a, oh wait a minute, this is earlier than that. Excuse me, I'm, I'm because uh, no, this would be earlier than that. Uh, Okay. In the 90s? In the 90s. In the okay. early 90s, not early the early 90s. 90s. Great. One time when I went back, because I remember this was taken by the student after me, who's a, a, a friend of mine now, his name is Casper Knudsen, and his, uh, he's Danish, and his teacher, his original teacher, was, was a Christian Steenstra. Really? Yeah. Small world. That is a small world. It's a world. small world, you know, when you, when you think about the fact that I took lessons with Ross B. Kraft, uh, there's kind of a small world that <laughs> revolves around Arnold Jacobs. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, Christian is, uh, I think, doing some really great work yeah, he is, yeah, he is, um, yeah. in Europe, and I saw where he had uh, an appointment at the Royal Northern Conservatory of Music. Yeah. He has a, yeah. A, a, and of course, he's in Denmark. and He's, he's getting around a lot. Yeah, he is. Yeah. Developed some nice uh, video uh, master classes. Yeah. Yeah. Good. And his new book, his new book, uh, Blow Your Mind, yes. is terrific. Really good. Yeah. yeah. I so. agree. Well, 
Um, we can't thank you enough for uh, Steve messaged me last year. Um, uh, I guess somehow you must have seen that I was in Italy and I uh, interviewed a couple of Italian brass players, Luca mm -hmm. and, and Andrea, uh, and you messaged me and that we had a great conversation. And I said, man, I gotta come. I gotta come meet Steve. <laughs> so it just worked out. Just things worked out with uh, uh, us coming to France and then Switzerland. And um, I owe Dave Coots a, a, a visit uh, up in Amsterdam. I'll get you next time, Dave. Sorry about that. Um, anyway, it's so we're so grateful for to you for opening up your your home and just reminiscing and talking and sharing your experiences with Mr. Jacobson. And as a, a more tangible token of our appreciation, <laughs> uh, we have this lovely party gift, this uh, Tuba People TV uh, glass. Wow. So I'll give that to you. That's a, that's a big beer you can put in there. Well, it's, you know, it's oh, medium. Whatever. It's not too warm bad. Milk. Warm milk. Yeah, probably warm milk. It came over the Atlantic, so <laughs> there's some special uh, specialness about it. <laughs> Wonderful. I think the crystalline structure changed uh, <laughs> as, it, as it went over the Atlantic. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see it half full, not half empty. Okay, that sounds good. That sounds good. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. Thanks for, for including me on this terrific project here. Yeah, my pleasure. And now back to you. Hey, everybody. A uh, little addendum, little coda. Um, Steve and I just came back from dinner and we kept talking. And uh, we thought of a couple other things to talk about. So, uh, Steve, you were talking about how Jacobs uh, had you using solfege or singing quite a bit. A lot of singing, yeah. He wanted me to do a lot of singing, uh, vocalizing to get pitches, but also phrasing and, and uh, color and, and singing it musically as I could. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that had a lot to do with, uh, I think, reinforcing neurologically the the storytelling and the conceptual thought. Yeah, so because you had mentioned earlier about uh, playing the mouthpiece and that sort of thing, so the singing was definitely part of that. Yep. Part yeah, of that process. He was singing before playing on the mouthpiece, I think. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Before, Did he? Oh, go ahead. Uh, I usually would say first sing it, and then okay. then play it on the mouthpiece. He had me sing it a few lessons a few times. I remember. I remember there was this like this process. If you can't play it, buzz it. If you can't buzz it, sing it. Mm -hmm. Do you recall anything about that, or was that? Not necessarily involved with you. Mm, I would say it was an implied, but okay. he, he he never said never said if you can't play it and buzz it can't. He didn't use those actually words, but he he would say uh, that singing reinforced that, that 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 neurological process. And so obviously with solfege, then there would be uh, specific words for specific notes. Right. Um, was there were there times when it was just. Uh, La la la, or <laughs> for me because I could never learn to do the solfege. I think, uh, well, he, he often talked about putting words to a song, yeah, uh, w words to a melody, to especially to, you know to communicate an emotion or to be expressive. Uh, but um, I, he was capable of solfege and really yeah. doing it with the uh, the actual Italian of, of vowels and everything. I never really learned how to do that, and I wish I had. Mm -hmm. I think it does help. Yeah, there's something to be said for learning the real solfege, sure. the Italian vowels and everything. Uh, but he, he did talk about occasionally making up words or putting words to uh, any kind of melody mm -hmm. to, for expression. And uh, um, But mostly it was just uh, being able to sing, sing the pictures, and he was fine if I didn't know the solfege. He, of course, was able to do it. Very, very well. He was a master at it. He was it, a yeah. master, yeah. He, he, he talked about Broca's area of the brain and how um, when you add words to pitches, it magnifies the exactly. sound of the pitch in the mind, and so then that is louder in the mind, and so it can go down the seventh cranial nerve to the lip and help excite the embouchure to yep. play the right pitch or something, <laughs> something sure. like that. I'm absolutely sure. Solfege is really strong in the French school. I yes. have to say most of my colleagues are really good at it. And I think it, 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 it does really help. And I wish it was something that was in the training in the United States more because it, I think there's a lot of value to it. But it's hard to learn a little bit later in life, the mm -hmm. actual, the actual uh, solfege itself, you know. And, and just in terms of the aging process, so, you know, you started at 20, ended at 40 mm -hmm. with your lessons. Mm -hmm. You know, you get to be 40, you know, 
things are starting to change physiologically. Yeah. And when you're 20, you think I can do anything, anytime, <laughs> anywhere for anybody. And when you're 40, you're starting to think, eh, maybe it didn't go so well the last time. I wonder how it's going to go this time. <laughs> very, very true. <laughs> now, he talked a lot about the aging process, which has been a big help to me now because I'm 62. 63. Oh 63. So when you're really you're in your 64th year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Oh no, yeah, that is true. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I'm still here. <laughs> um, yes, uh, he, we talked a lot about that, and he, he one of the things he talked about was that you had to really go off of feel. Because uh, when you, you know, we don't have a lot of nerve endings in the thoracic region and you feel the expansion and you think I'm taking a big breath, but the, it feels exactly the same at 60 than it did at 35, but you're actually taking in a lot less air. So when you say go off of feel, like in the States, when we would say go off of that, we would say you would be paying attention to. Yeah. So you're paying attention to the feel. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I, th I think the biggest secret with him about the aging process was to realize that it's not going to feel the same, and therefore you cannot base it on that. Uh, the, it's a variable. The way you feel is a variable from day to day, and maybe more so when you get in your later years. You know, it's, it's you don't recover quite as quickly. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, yeah. And uh, the, the big thing is basically to ignore that and keep uh, keep uh, your sound comps the concepts very strong. And I would say basically take more. More air. More air. Take in bigger breaths. Breathe more often when you have to. You don't want to get down to the point where you're, you're, you know, really at the end of your capacity because the next breath becomes more difficult. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, and the other thing, of course, to slow down a lot is the tongue. Your, mm -hmm. your speed of single tonguing slows. So you've got to become more adept at multiple tonguing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the speed of the, the, the tongue gets slower. It gets slower. Yeah. It absolutely gets slower. But none of this is really a problem. It's, it's, you, it's very easy to adjust it. You just got right. to be aware of it. And you have to rethink things musically sometimes, you know, things that you could do in two breaths, all of a sudden you have to do in three now. But if you know, if you figure out where the right place is to breathe, it doesn't disrupt the line musically as long as it's not in the you know, middle of a really exposed phrase or something. Yeah, I think, I think you hit it right on the head. You know, so much of the time it can get a pro be a problem when you're not aware of it and, you, and then you start to experience it and you think, well, what's going on with me? What's wrong? And then you start to... Put but your you investigator cap on while you're playing, but if you know this information ahead of time, then you can say, oh, oh yeah, I remember hearing about this, I need to do this in order to compensate for this being a little bit older, losing a little capacity. Exactly, exactly. Tongue firing a little bit yeah, slower. It's kind of being prepared for that and knowing it's normal and nothing to get worried about and nothing to get, you know, obsessively focused on or go inward. Right. I mean, uh, that's the whole thing. I mean, it, uh, at any age, it still has to be a statement, and as long as that's, as long as you're geared towards that, you you won't be too thrown by these little variables in, in the way it feels. Mm -hmm. And and uh, and it, it frankly it feels plenty comfortable once you get your if you're focused. But uh, you know sometimes uh, after a really heavy blow, I uh, I f at 63 I, I feel it more the next morning. No question about it. A little more swollen, a little stiffer. Right. Yeah, I mean, there are no 50- or 60-year-old football teams out there, you know. <laughs> They're all 20s and 30s, and there's yeah. a reason for that, because they yeah. can recover more quickly. Yeah, but experience trumps youth any day. Experience is very good, I have to say that, <laughs> for sure. And just, you know, physiologically, as we age, we lose lung capacity, so that's why this whole thing yeah. of, of uh, being, uh, you know, you, the breath that you have that feels full when you're 40 yeah. And you feel full when you're 60, it's not the same amount it's, of air. It's not the same amount of air. That's it isn't. And so yeah. the, the, maybe the phrase markings that you had marked in when you were 40, yeah. you can't quite make those no. breaths. I'm sure I'm sure I'm at least a half a liter less than I was in, in my prime. I'm right. sure. But uh, again, I think the, the um, if you take the emphasis off feel, it's not a problem as long as, uh, as, long as you're concentrating on the product. Uh, you adapt, right? You know, I, I think in, in general it's not just the lungs, but in uh, flexibility is what elasticity mm -hmm. becomes a, a, a little less um, uh, fluent mm -hmm. in, in older years. More important than that, you don't play with any kind of a fixed or set setup. You know, 
because you, you need all the all the kind of uh, flexibility you can have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, be adaptable. Yeah, exactly. Right. What did Jake say? Never uh, stabilize the armature. Always stabilize the music. Exactly. Yeah. And then if you stabilize the music, the ambusha will respond. Exactly. Whether you're old or young. <laughs> yeah, well, that's great. Some really good stuff. And we could actually go on and on and on and on. But I guess we should probably <laughs> let you go to bed. <laughs> okay. Thanks, man. <laughs> yeah.